right. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, get into one of our main features here tonight. Now, I know you a TV guy there. I am. I'm going to give my top 10 of 2018. Martin is going to give his top 10 of 2018. And then we'll even have some honorable mentions up in there. Uh, Martin, do you mind if I go first? No. With my I, top please. 10? Thank you. Thank you. Because you know something, there's bound to be some overlap, too. Absolutely. Some differences. You know, we are two different people, but there's a lot of overlap. We got similar tastes when it comes to certain things. And as with most lists, we're going to start out with number 10, work our way up to number one. And I'm going to start out with my number 10. And my number 10 might be a surprise for some people out there. For one, you might not even remember the movie. Mr. Gruber. Oh, what's this? Oh, this is London. Oh, Paddington. And that is Paddington 2. Paddington came out early last year. And the thing with Paddington, man, the reason why I had this as my number 10 is because, one, I, I am one of the people who love this movie so much that I didn't forget it. And sadly, I knew it would be kind of forgotten and pushed to the side. There's a timeliness to it because it's just so sweet and innocent. And this is a sequel. And was able to still capture what with the just what I'm talking about, what made the first one so so great. I dare say it's better than the first one. Uh, you know what? And I dare say that it is better than the first one, too. Again, something that you don't see. Because the first one, while it was very sweet natured and sort of a surprise for people, uh, and you know what? It also did something that expanded on since I think they were maybe might have been playing with more of a budget, the art direction in this is amazing. From the song numbers, this, there are musical numbers in here, and they don't feel like, you know, uh, uh, some studio obligatory uh, song for a family film right. to sell or to fill time. No, they're actually very creative and funny. The performances they, are, while everybody gives a fine performance, that this one has probably a more standout performance than the first one did. Mm. You know who I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. My, my boy who got shafted at the Oscar nomination. Yep. Hugh Grant, man. Hugh Grant plays the villain in this movie, and he plays it so well because he plays a um, he plays just a pretty self-absorbed theater guy. Uh, yeah, actor. <laughs> actor, yeah. You know, I can't stand actors anyway. <laughs> at least not the kind of getting actor he but is. he's such a thespian type actor. <laughs> he's such a pretentious prick. <laughs> He just and, and and it's funny because he's so into himself. That's why he actually messes up a lot. Uh -huh. But it's hilarious how he comes across in the movie. Prison is no laughing matter, and I should know. I spent three years in Les Misérables. <laughs> <laughs> like he can, that's what it is. He's always on. He can't stop <laughs> acting. Uh -huh. <laughs> it is, you know, and, it's, and, the, and the thing about it is, you get mad, but you see how people are charmed by him. Yeah. It's like, man, you know what? If I was there, I'd be laughing too. Let's go ahead and get into uh, the, my number nine movie. Still controversial for some people. Uh, and and, and it, was, it is a movie that was controversial at first. Controversy slowed down. Big success. Nobody had anything to say. Then it got nominated. Now it's controversial again. Huh. What kind of king you are going to be? You know, the big controversy is whether this should be nominated for Best Picture, which it is. A lot of people like, okay, like I said, this this is just the you know make these Negroes shut up award, <laughs> right? You know, just get just give them something. <laughs> you know, we can, we know it ain't gonna win. They know it ain't gonna win, but just give them a little nod. As far as being on my list, you know, I, I the, even the quality of the movie for some people that can be argued, but for me. It was a it was a it was a it was a good movie. It was a great movie. I had a, I, you know I went to go see this four times because not only because of enthusiasm that I had for the cultural relevance of it, but also because I really genuinely had a good time. Now that's not to say that the cultural impact does not play a factor here because it does, man. It moved me like no other movie of 2018. I'm not saying I'm, that movies didn't move me in a different way, but again, a testament to the power of this being a total social experience uh you know it's we're not talking about big awards or accolades we're talking about a personal feeling for these films sure and this one was one of the most personal gratifications that i got from movies of 2018 uh let's go to my number eight movie and you know what this movie again it can be argued about the quality of it especially when you talk about how 
there's a certain amount of manipulation that goes on a couple levels in this movie. If people hate this. I get it. But just hear me out on why I say this one is in the position it is, it is on my list. I'm about to embark on a concert tour in the Deep South. What other experience do you have? Knocking motherfuckers out. That's, <laughs> that's Green Book. Uh-huh. I, I enjoyed the performances of uh, 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 Mah- Mah- Mahershala Ali and Viggo Mortensen, man. Viggo Mortensen, I had, he was playing a stereotype, but you played it well. Yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. know, you played Italian, stere- Italian stereotype so well. I mean, usually it's an Italian actor, so you go like, well, yeah, you grew up with this. Yeah. But not him. No, I mean, I, almost every line is bada bing, bada boom. <laughs> you know, but I... But he's such a great actor, he brought something to it. Relations. Do you foresee any issues in working for a black man? You and the Deep South? There's gonna be problems. Promise me you're gonna write me a letter. No problems. You know, that is one of the reasons why I can see people complain about this, because it is a movie full of stereotypes. And I'm gonna tell you something about the movie that I clearly recognize. It's, it's one of those movies about race that's meant to make white people feel good when they walk out. Mm. You know, like, well, you know what? They spent about five hours together. <laughs> you know, that's all it takes to, like, get over racism, just be in a confined space. Hollywood loves put movies out like that. You know, the feel-good movie for the white people out there about race. It's a well-made film that is a character-driven film. Let's take away also, because some people say, well, you know what, you you jumped on poor Freddie Mercury and just chewed his ass out for being uh, inaccurate in his movie, Bohemian Rhapsody. They changed all kinds of things. Finally came out that they changed a lot of things with this so-called uh, true story right here, too. This was a character-centered movie where I had to ask myself, if I was to watch this, if they, just, if they had just made everything up, like, let's just say this wasn't based on a true story, mm-hmm. and I watched this story, uh, these characters would still work. Yeah. You know, so what they made up a movie. At least yeah. they made up a you know they made up a good movie. Right? It, it, yeah. They had yeah, they never even written the words inspired by a true story. This yeah. still works. It still works as a character piece. You know what? I mean, I don't know. I kind of see this as payback for driving Miss Daisy. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let this Negro tell this white person to drive. Don't you want to see this old step and fetch shit they were uh, doing before? Turn the car around and go pick up your, your <laughs> chicken bones. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, they push a little bit too far with with the, with the whole black dignified thing. I don't eat fried chicken, Tony. Oh bullshit! <laughs> no, Here, eat some of this and tell me you don't eat fried chicken. Hell yeah, <laughs> nigga, stop lying. <laughs> you know when ain't nobody at home, you <laughs> bones all over the floor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you pick your bones up, bitch. But but because uh, that's the only time I'll say that. Yeah. Uh, fried chicken is in black people's DNA because it's in everybody's DNA. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get to my number seven movie. Uh, me talking about this movie and having given it a good review at the time that we talked about it, I'm still getting emails from people saying, what the fuck were you thinking? But I still hold to it, man. And I, Annihilation? Man, no, no, you know what? I, Thank you for reminding me. That that might have made another list before we're done. Mm-hmm. But no, no, I mean, people ask me, what the fuck, Corey? Because it is kind of a what the fuck movie. I'm just out here surviving, and what I'm doing right now won't even matter. You want to make some money here? Use your white voice. Hey, Mr. Kramer, this is <laughs> Langston from Regal View. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I first saw this trailer. That was the last thing I was expecting to hear uh, 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 Danny Glover sound like Pat Oswalt. <laughs> uh, Steve Buscemi. It's, that's even worse. <laughs> it's even more horrifying. <laughs> well, I love his explanation was that no, 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 not the not the white voice you're used to using to go to work. Your real white voice, the one that sounds like you don't have a care in the world. Yeah, he said not like Will Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Will Smith, hey. <laughs> so, so this looks pretty interesting. What, what's this movie about? Well, you know something. I'm glad you asked because my, I have so many different ideas about filmmaking, and one of my diff, one of the one of my highest regards in filmmaking is that the reason why I appreciate. Indie cinema is because people need to take more risk with stories. People need to do things that, that aren't told the same way. Or things that ain't, ain't told that well, they're not told that way at all. Um, this is from uh, uh, Boots Riley, uh, you know, rapper from uh, The Coup. He was a hip hop artist turned filmmaker. Uh, and this is this is the most unique vision 
of a story that I've seen all year. Nothing can touch this. Uh, True. You know, this, I mean, maybe, you know, this is maybe for some people too unique. <laughs> you know, some people like, look, man, I, like, Cor- what did you just make me go see? <laughs> that, I can tell you the moment because I told a lot of people to uh, to see this movie and a lot of people did and 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 all and, and a lot of them came back and they said and, and you know got to a point in that movie where I said man fuck Corey <laughs> and I could tell and I could tell people that I could tell I could, and I say let me guess this is when <laughs> and there's a moment in here where is that 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 okay. for everybody that's exact that's exactly it but what you have here you have uh, oh what's his name uh, uh, uh Lakeith, Lakeith Stanfield. Stanfield yeah he plays a uh, he plays a telemarketer, uh, you know, because this is the only job that he can really get at the moment. He's going to lose his apartment, which is not but a refurbished garage yeah. in his uncle's place. But uh, this goes deeper into a, a conspiracy about corporate greed and manipulation. The uh, this whole thing with the with the telemarketing that's just the tip. It's when he starts to rise up in the company, starts to get more perks because he's put on his white voice, become something different, you know, you know, not true to himself anymore. Mm-hmm. It's all about selling out and also making gotcha. a it's also making a, a comment about how really controlling corporations can be over what we do and how little control we have over that. Uh even though we think that we're getting more out of it. Uh I, and to me the the point where it took this, you know, this very very exaggerated turn I appreciated I appreciated that even more because even though it's insane, it still makes sense within the context of what they're saying, mm-hmm. and it still makes sense with the message that they're trying to give. I mean, sometimes you know, talk about not laying out a, a, a heavy handed message. No, just get fucking nuts with it. All right? Yeah. <laughs> you want to get nuts, Jack? Yeah, let's, let's get, get nuts. nuts. Mm. The number six movie on my list, and the, the and, and you know what? And the reason why this is number six on my list, for starters. There's a certain man out there, and a lot of people said, you know something, this human being right here cannot get any better. And this documentary says, oh, yeah? Mr. Roger, I want to tell you something. What would you like to tell I like you. I like you, my dear. Thank you. You don't know, Mr. Rogers is the kind of guy that that made you say, you know what, I might not be a religious guy, but if there is a God, Mr. Rogers is the reason why. <laughs> like, there is good in this world. <laughs> there, yeah. There, 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 well, was. Yeah. He's gone. Yeah, now. it's almost yeah. like maybe he just put all the goodness in Mr. Rogers. And that's why the rest of the world is fucked up. <laughs> right. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Mr. Rogers, uh, th- you know, this documentary about Mr. Rogers, it just moved me so much when I saw this, man. And it moved me in a way that it was inspirational. I've, I, I, cr- I cried from just wanting to be a better person after seeing this mm-hmm. and seeing how... You know, there really is goodness in people, man. You know, Mr. Rogers is the kind of person you need to go see this on a bad day. And Mr. Rogers will make you believe in the world, make you believe in humanity, <laughs> you know. And that's what, the, you know, and this was as something. As long as Mr. Rogers is out there, we're going to be all right. Yeah. Well, Wait, what do you mean he's dead? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you'll have someone like Mr. Rogers who's as good, but you won't have anybody like this again. And really, documentaries, that's what documentaries should be, man. They should be able to educate you, move you to either want to be better, make change, educate you. And that that happened right here. I think it's a crime. This is what let me know that almost based on this being shunned at the Oscars, being looked over, this made me want to say, you know what? The hell with the Oscars, man. I I enjoyed this movie a lot, and that's why it's on my number six. I'm like, well, damn, Corey, how come this one number one? (laughs) Even number, even, even number five. Well, number five had to go to this movie right here because this movie, it was the first movie that I saw uh, in 2018, where I said, you know, I'll go back and forth on a lot of things, but this is definitely on my list. And I did say it's going to be in my top five. And sure enough, I mean, it ended up at number five, but it made it in there for good reason. I always knew, like, you were going to do something, that you'd be all right. It's the first time I'm worried about you. Dave Chappelle telling you that <laughs> something, something wrong. Uh, a Star is Born. And you know what? I, I Forgive me. I forgot to mention the last movie is Won't You Be My Neighbor? Uh, you know, named after uh, Mr. Rogers' famous catchphrase. Uh, Star is Born. You know what? I know that this is getting a lot of praise for being the directorial debut of Bradley Cooper, but the, the film speaks for itself, too. It does. Uh, you know, I... Uh, yeah, it's an amazing directorial debut. But you know what I liked about this is that a movie that is sitting on on music so much and getting praised for music, there is a lack of music in here that actually 
allows Bradley Cooper to center on the actors more. Mm. I love when you take actors in a film. There's two things I really love in movies when it comes to actors. Actors who aren't really actors and they're real people and they come across as real people in films. Mm -hmm. Or you can take big actors and make them appear to just be ordinary people. And uh, I mean, shit, if you can make... If Lady you can make Gaga. Lady Gaga seem like a human being, <laughs> you know, then then you've uh, you've done a great feat. Uh, She's dressed way down for most of this movie. Yeah, and I and I love the way he took people like Andrew Dice Clay and uh, who played his brother in this. Um, uh, oh, uh, Sam Elliott. Sam Elliott, and even Bradley Cooper himself, who showed us a side uh, uh, of him, but we didn't know he had a talent uh, for music. I mean, mm. I know they like they say he really done. He just picked it up really quick. Like, well, damn, that's well, better that, than that's, me. That's, that's even more impressive. Yeah. Shit, I took Trump up for three years. And I can't play shit with that. <laughs> Bradley Cooper could pick up a guitar and make a movie about it. <laughs> and then, but yeah, to to hear that a, an actor that you know who's been doing stuff is directing a movie, you go like, oh, well, that's so cute. Let's let's yeah. see your little movie, and then he puts out this, and you're like. Well, holy shit, man. I mean, to put this out... Well, I mean, with these yeah. kind of performances and these musical numbers and he's directing and starring and and singing. I mean, singing in a way where you're like, I would buy that album. Yeah. Most most actors Damn. are kind of bullshit. They kind of bullshit their way through it. You're like, well, they didn't embarrass themselves. But he's doing something. You're like, that actually sounds good. It, yeah, when I heard him come out and start playing, uh, I was like, man, fuck this dude. You know? <laughs> Like, that's too much. I know you're gonna be handsome and have all this talent. You're handsome can direct. You can act. Now you can play guitar and say, "Man, somebody got to stop you." <laughs> I'll be honest with you. The movie that beat it is a movie that people have been telling me to watch. They say, "You know, just just why you don't have to love it, just just so you know you watch it and you're complete." You know, uh, a lot of people are praising this film. Watch this movie yesterday. Mm -hmm. I hadn't seen it before. Watch it yesterday. Oh and, wow! It made, made, made number made four. It you number four? and it immediately made. Uh, I didn't know where it was going to fall, but again, a movie I knew was going to be uh, in my top five somewhere, and it made it at number four. Uh, and it's I, and for some people, it's the definition of an art house film. But maybe I'm partial to that. I don't know. <laughs> Cold War number four. Man, I was one of the main people telling you to watch this movie. And then when you had me fill out my list today, I forgot it because I would have had it at number 10. I know. I was Ooh. mad, too. I was like, I know he didn't tell me to watch this movie. He didn't put it on there. <laughs> I, I what is some kind of it. trick? I kept talking about it so much, and then I forgot. Uh, the reason why I am But I knew you would love it. No, I am totally in love with this. Uh, you know, this is... Okay, so this movie, when you think of... When everybody, when people say uh, uh, a pretentious art film, this is the movie that they're talking about. You know, but it's no. When, it, when somebody says pretentious art film, I think it's something that gets completely esoteric and crawls up its own ass. And this movie doesn't do that. See, when I think being a pretentious art house prick myself, because <laughs> you know, I love look. Because I, I was at a, I was at an art theater when I saw this, uh, and I thought it was something. I said, is this some French New Wave film I hadn't seen before? Because listen, you know, at least that there was a period where the pretentious art movie meant that it met certain criteria. It was black and white. Mm -hmm. It was foreign. Mm -hmm. Extra points for being French, which half of this is in yeah. a way. Uh, you know, everybody's unhappy. For no reason, <laughs> like they, they like they make their unhappiness. They force it. Love is doomed, right? You right, know, it's right, this right. is this is what people used to think of when they thought of art house movies, man. Uh, and I'm sure in the movie somewhere, I saw somebody wearing a beret or something. You know, it's uh, it is. I don't blame people for looking at this and thinking, "Wow, this is kind of pretentious itself." The characters really do spell their own doom and gloom in the movie. For Boy, really, howdy! For no, and I have to. The only thing I was frustrated with, like they talk about how this movie is going to movie and break your heart, I'm like no, because they they. There's nothing wrong with them. They had everything they want. I just looked at it as like, you know what? They have a completely different way of thinking. They fucked things up for themselves. I was like, you know what it was? Things were so good with them. Good looking couple traveling around Europe in the in the in the fifties, going to all the nice bars, them musicians being admired by everybody. And they said, Man, you know what? This is so good. It's too good. How can we fuck this up? Well, they're also under an oppressive regime as well. It's uh, it, it is communist Poland. Yeah, one guy's a war. He, he's a he's a a, 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 a I guess a war uh, a, a exile an a, 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 an exiled artist. Mm -hmm. She's uh, a, a, a girl from the village who just doesn't adjust to this you know this fast paced modern life. She's she's kind of crazy herself, but 
you know, it. I tell you, man, it, it is it is the best looking film that I saw last year. Hands down. I'm saying that right now. It is the best looking movie because this movie is 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 it's I, should, I, should, I describe Roma like this. It is one long, beautiful black and white photo. Mm-hmm. Every shot. Yeah. Every shot. I don't care what it is. Every shot is carefully composed. They open up the movie with some of the most broke ass looking people in that village. I'm like, why do people even choose to live like this? <laughs> Like people just playing the camera, just covered, play, playing uh, playing music against the camera, covered in dirt and chicken shit, teeth missing. Mm-hmm. I thought that's amazing because I, I didn't know what to expect. They start out in, the, in this, this small communist village in Poland, and then they move up to these really, you know, uh, stylish scenes in uh, in, in, in the uh, uh, the jazz setting of Paris. And yeah. I'm like, wow, this I did not expect this man at all. You know what? I just have a thing for European love stories. I told you I love New Wave, and they are they are often doomed and for no yeah. reason. And I just so want to pull that guy aside and go like, man, I know she's hot, but you, you got to let it go. She's going to be bad for you. And sure though, she's just drag. She's driving this dude crazy. Yeah. It's like this lust thing, right? You kind of know from the get-go what this is going to be, where it's like this obsessive love, it, and you know it can only end one way. It's so passionate. Yeah. That's what it is. Passion to the point of driving them insane. Dude, you start out not knowing what you're getting into. Mm. Nah, he goes and picks. He's looking for talent. He's a part of a, a, of a, of a talent search for he wants to bring authentic music to the people. So he goes to like the village and just brings out, just, just brings out the dirtiest looking ass people he can get. It's almost yeah. like, a, like a context. Like, look, man, I can take all these bitches and make them look good. <laughs> you yeah, know, I always think of it like Moby, like just looking for somebody authentic and real in a village and ain't going to make music out of it. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, I, I mean, I, if it weren't for some other factors with all these other movies, I mean, it would be my number one because I just love this movie so much because wow. of the style. I just love the, the look and the style of it, man. I want to go home and put this on again tonight uh, when I get home and watch mm-hmm. it again. Uh, yeah, this ain't going to end well. <laughs> uh, let's get to the number three movie on my list. Uh, there's a there's a few movies that were considered to be kind of message films in a certain category or area, and this movie right here I thought stood out the most and got pushed and also and, but, but somehow also got forgotten the most. Yo, bro, stop! Stop! Don't you? Don't stop. That's Blind Spotting at number three, and Blind Spotting was a movie that was so small that it did not get the kind of campaign push that it should, and therefore was forgotten. But I got to tell you, out of all the black message movies that we had, and there were year, a lot, and there were a lot. And out of all of those, this was the one that I think was the was this was the one that I thought delivered the most creative experience as far as the film goes. It was the fiercest message that I got, but also didn't do it at sacrificing entertainment factors here uh you know because it goes as a slow build from a comedy tinge with just a little bit of tragedy uh and the reason why the tragedy isn't built up so much at first as you saw there's a it was a uh, shooting of a of a young black male running had his back turned shot by a cop uh hits a little too close to home but also a sad factor of that is that those crimes often go those murders often go uh, uh uh without punishment no acquittals that people are set free all the time. So it's kind of his attitude of just like, you know what? That's just the way it is. And the movie kind of takes that, that route. That's just the way it is, man. We just got to learn to laugh this off. But what I liked about it is that while it was it remained funny most of the way through, it dropped a lot of knowledge in the, in the middle of it on a lot of things. But mostly with the P- PTSD that that uh, uh, D- uh, David Diggs characters experience it. And that PTSD builds up to this powerful, explosive ending with this really great speech. And yet, like I said, somehow did not come across too heavy handed and still left you feeling pretty good when you left the theater, man. Uh, Part of that is because of uh, the chemistry with these guys, man, Uh, David Diggs and Raphael Casal. Those guys are the ones that really made this entertaining. You just love watching them. You couldn't have no story in this. These guys could just just be doing random things in a movie with no real story or, or, or goal. And I would love seeing them, man. Let's go to now. Let's go to some things you might be winding this down to. You know, it's like, all right, this is on everybody's list, so it has to be on yours. Which one is it? Uh, 
Let's see, I had a hard time going between these two movies, man. Uh, that at, at that are at number two and at number one. Uh, it finally came down to number two being this movie, which was hard because again, like Cold War, it is a it's one long, gorgeous piece of photographic art. It's a moving photograph that is amazing looking. Uh, but also, it is the it is probably the most personal and heartfelt movie that I saw in 2018 at number two. That band made me laugh <laughs> so much. <laughs> I kept thinking that, of that Salvation Army band in, in uh, the 1960s Batman movie. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, every time something tragic or sad would happen, this band would just come through. Move, lady. <laughs> we ain't got time for your... Sad trombone coming yeah. through. <laughs> In her face. <laughs> Blowing her hair back. I'm talking about Roma. Alfonso Cuaron directed this. And I say this is uh, personal because Alfonso Cuaron is pretty much... It's not as tragic as it seems. Talk about a movie where things happen that seem tragic or sad. But it really is just kind of like, man, this was my childhood growing up. They even like... Re- uh, I think they rebuilt the home uh, that he that he lived in. Or built something that looked like the home that he uh, grew up in. And uh, this is just as a... This is about as slice of life as you can get except more beautiful than the average slice of life movies that we see probably more personal uh more artistic than ever um you know part of this and this is him when he grew up in his household and also how close the 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 maid was to the family uh and how the maid stayed with them through some of the more downer moments in their family and uh besides it's just looking uh amazing like i said you just feel like uh, but sometimes you don't know where this is going, but you feel like this guy is just uh, giving us something pretty to look at as he just kind of goes through his own memories, his own cherished memories as he shares them with us. Uh, it's hard to get that kind of personal feeling in a film like you had here and make it look as good as it is and still make you want to come back and just soak it all in again, uh, at least for me. And that ending uh, with the movie where you don't think that this is leading anywhere had a very powerful ending man that just moved me so much uh, when it happened and also how it just went back to saying hey you know just like life we're getting right life back goes to on. it yep. yeah, you have high moments you have low moments but we still got to continue uh, one of the reasons why you get this feeling of the, 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 this personal feeling and the reason why I feel so real amidst all this unworldly looking beauty that you have is uh, because some of the people they have in the movie, especially this 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 girl uh, Yalitza Aparicio, uh, who is not an actress, uh, she was just somebody they brought in because uh, she had the look that they were looking for, and she felt real, and she really does bring the movie down to an area where it's like, all right, all this just looks unearthly, but she brings it down to a, to a, a grounded uh, uh, feel. Uh, because she feels like a real person. Uh, again, something I personally enjoy. So. That's at number two, Roma. Man, I thought that for sure this was your number one. I have to know what what beat Roma for you. Well, you know something? And it was a hard draw. But this it came down to this because this was the second most unique vision that I saw uh, in 2018. I mean, it really had me a little confused in the best way. Mm-hmm. And I told you, the, the night that I saw it, I, I first I was a little confused. And by the end of it, I was just in love with this film that I have here at number one. Everyone leaves me. Dies. Ah! I hoped I might be employed here by you as something. A monster for the children to play with, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is such a strange movie for me. And at number one, it is the favorite. But I really enjoyed this movie because it had it had a lot of things going for it all in one. Mm. Uh, first of all, I'm, I had a discussion with my wife yesterday because she saw it and she's like, like I didn't like it. She, no, she said I liked it. She's like, what was so funny? I'm like, oh, what's so funny? I said, it's a comedy. She's like, no, it's not a comedy. I was like, mm-hmm. I, 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 bet I, to differ. I bet to very much differ. <laughs> Should I bet money on different with you? I was like, this is a comedy, but but I get it because it's it it does have these moments in here. Uh, it's it's of dark. sadness. It's dark. Yeah. It's very dark, you know, because the, you have people who are suffering. Uh-huh. You have people who are uh, stabbing each other in the back. Yeah. Sometimes, literally, you uh-huh. know, it's a, there are moments in this movie that it's hard to capture the tone of it. And I thought, you know, she even had me thinking, I'm like, well, maybe it's not a comedy. Maybe the director's just crazy, you know? Well, uh, Emma Stone's character, she comes in 
where you see like she had some station and then she gets there she's thrown to the bottom yes and what happens to her her fate is pretty much in the hands of everyone else except her until she claws her way out of that situation you have yeah you have uh, uh what's her name uh, uh emma stone uh, emma stone who comes in and they are ready they are they are ready just uh, uh knocking her while she's already down letting her know exactly her place when she comes in you are you are lower than the dirt you about to clean up and don't forget that and you just first of all you just kind of I, I love how you root for somebody just to go against this, you know, the uh, the, the stuffy, stuck up aristocracy uh-huh. they got going on, and then, and, and then the tide turns, and then the tide turns, yeah, very much, and it's just the turn that it took. But the way that people are just so shitty to each other in this movie just made me laugh. Uh-huh. They're just petty to the point of, just, oh, yeah. I mean, they're just so they're just mean to each other to the point of just being petty, yeah, physically and mentally. Uh, but there were certain things in this movie where uh, the camera work added to the frantic nature of these characters, man. You know, the extreme forced wide angles, uh, the swish pan to characters in the movie, which added oh, yeah. to, the, to, to the humor the, the, to me. The fisheye lens. The fisheye lens at times. The, um, the, the dance <laughs> number that, <laughs> that looks like a Soul Train line. Boy, that dance number had, that's the thing that I said, okay, if, look, if this ain't a comedy, <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. Uh, yeah, they have uh, in this movie where uh, they're dancing for the queen. And when they're dancing for the queen, they do, they they just do out of nowhere. There's no reason why they start dancing like they on soul, like you say on soul train. <laughs> you know, and the queen is even like, she's like, I don't know what's happening. Stop! Stop it! <laughs> it's like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> it was the absurdity, the weird tone in this movie, the crazy shit that just happened out of nowhere that made me laugh out loud in even my time, and during my time watching, thinking like, I'm not even sure if this is a comedy, but I don't care. Yeah. I'm laughing. But the it's it's but I have a thing for period pieces too. I you know, I think that if you if you can make a unique vision and you're making a period piece and you you're making this period piece that isn't uh that isn't dry. Mm-hmm. That isn't, you know, that that is that isn't taking itself too seriously. Like when and you put it in there with fine performances like uh, Olivia Coleman. Emma Stone, all these people were great. Rachel Weisz, yeah. and one person who's not getting any attention at all, Beast or whatever his oh, name. Oh, Nicholas Holt. Nicholas Holt. The funny thing is, every time somebody talks about this movie, they always manage to mention him in it. Yeah, and he gets he's the he's the one who's not nominated, and he's the one that's not nominated. The one that's hardly ever mentioned, except for the people who've seen the movie and mentioned it to each other. But uh, you know, like I said, all this, all of these unique features and all these great features are wrapped up in this uh, period piece, which itself is gorgeously shot. Yeah. And like, like I said, I like the camera work that they chose to do with. Like a lot of people would, they, you know, th- to add to the absurdity to it, Martin said, they put that weird fisheye lens in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've gone, you know, uh, they've done a period piece and done everything to make it one of the most unique period pieces that I've seen. And I, you know, and because I was just, I was in such admiration at the absurdity and just the, the, the unique vision of it. That's why, to me, it hit, hit number one. I, I, I completely understand. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, I just, I, and let me look. I don't even like stuffy period piece movies. I admire them, but if they're too dry and too full of themselves, I don't like it. And that's why I looked at this and I was like, I'm surprised that I love this movie as much as I do. But I, I do, man. These, these moments in the movie, um, they're just moments in here which just, which just, like I said, man, they just came out of nowhere, and just made me laugh. If anybody's a fan of Monty Python. Hmm. There were moments in there like that that just they, just they just catch you off guard and they don't have anything to do with the story. They do have things to do with the characters and it just made, you know, and, and, but when they catch you off guard, that makes you laugh even more. Could you just look at me? Look at me! How dare you! <laughs> that poor kid. <laughs> I, 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 I love this movie, man. I watched some of it again the other day just to make sure that I just wasn't just being, again, a pretentious prick with this and I was like, nah, I'm Nah, this, I'm, this movie's gold. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm laughing my ass off at this, and it looks great. That's my number one. Thank you so much for watching the video. And can I just ask just one small little favor? How about hitting that subscribe button? Oh, you know, just this is it. Just one more thing. Go check out our main site, doubletoasted.com. Over there, you'll find a longer-form version of the video and also the live stream that we do almost every night of the week. Okay, one last thing. This is it. Support us at dtmerch.com and stay... Posty.